Let's discuss neuropathic pain and let's focus on the definition of neuropathic pain for this talk. If you can define it, you can diagnose it and early diagnosis means early and better treatment. I've been a pain specialist for over 20 years and at the end of this discussion what I'll do is I will share with you what I think is the most debilitating neuropathic pain condition. So let's dive straight into the definition of neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is defined as pain that is caused by a lesion or a disease of the somatosensory nervous system. Uh, the somatosensory nervous system is that part of the nervous system that is involved in sensation. It's called somatic sensation, so sensation within the body. And sensation is not all painful sensation. Sensation is how your body is in space and time, so proprioception. Sensation is the internal state of your organs, so what you feel in terms of organ sensation, so the sensation of the intestines and other organs within the body. And then, of course, external sensation, which is what we're really talking about here, and that's touch, that is temperature, and that is pain. So that is the somatosensory nervous system. Now what I've said is this is a disease or a lesion within the somatosensory nervous system. So something has happened to this nervous system uh, to trigger uh, pain. And this pain is a certain type of pain. This is what we call a neuropathic pain condition. What I've got on the screen now is a diagrammatic representation of the somatosensory nervous system and how complex it is. Now there are different types of neuropathic pain. There is central neuropathic pain and peripheral neuropathic pain. Central neuropathic pain is exactly the same definition where the brain and spinal cord are affected by something. And then peripheral neuropathic pain is where a similar thing occurs but in the peripheral nervous system which is the nerves outside uh, the brain and spinal cord. Now part of uh, neuropathic pain is a definition called central sensitization, which is a very important definition to understand. I'll read it and then I'll define it for you and I'll, I'll, I'll break it down for you. It's increased responsiveness of neurons to their normal input or recruitment of a response of, to sub-threshold input. So what that means is, is a normal neuron at, at a resting state is excessively responsive and it responds excessively to an input or a neural um, a nerve that is resting at a at a sub sensory uh, threshold or sub threshold um, is recruited to respond so what that means is some nerves are, are resting normally and they respond excessively and some nerves that are resting call it less than normal, respond excessively as well. So they're recruited to feel when they shouldn't feel pain. Effectively, what sensitization is, is amplification of pain. It's dialing that volume of pain, grabbing that volume of pain and just dialing it up. That's sensitization. That's what people with neuropathic pain feel. It's way too high. It's really high and it spreads as well. Uh, so whereas neuropathic pain might start in a small area, it expands to a much bigger area. The same thing occurs with sensitization on the periphery and the central nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system can be sensitized and the central nervous system can be sensitized. There are other ways to elaborate and define neuropathic pain. Uh, and other definitions are important to know are allodynia and hyperalgesia. Allodynia is pain due to a stimulus which, was, which does not normally provoke pain. So if I take a brush uh, and brush uh, the skin of a person with uh, neuropathic pain, the brush hurts allodynia. And there are different types of allodynia where normal sensation hurts. There's brush allodynia, which, which, is what I've, which is what I've mentioned. There's static mechanical allodynia. So the mechanics, a light touch, can, can trigger pain, not brush. There's thermal allodynia, whereas uh, uh, warm or cold, it's not painful, but it hurts. It's not hot or cold, which can be painful. This is just warm or cool, which can be painful. And then there's deep somatic allodynia as well, which is pain on palpation or feeling the deeper structures, the deeper muscles. So that is allodynia, an important definition to be aware of. 
Let's compare that to the definition of hyperalgesia, which is an increased response to a normally painful stimulus. So that's where pain, which is a painful stimulus, so a, something that hurts, you feel it excessively, so it's off the charts, off the scale. Um, and we can define a, a hyperalgesia by clinical examination. So again, you use something that is mildly painful, like a toothpick, and it's excessively painful. That's hyperalgesia. And that's where the nerves respond in a different fashion. Uh, and there are a number of other aspects of allodynia and hyperalgesia. One of the ones that I quite uh, find interesting to examine patients or look or see when I examine patients is something called hyperpathia. And I'll read you the definition as well. But basically that's where you examine somebody and there's almost like an aftershock or an after sensation. So I put somebody on the examination table, I examine them, and when they get back to the chair, they say to me, it is now hurting, hyperpathia, aftershocks, after sensations. Um, and it's a delayed and excessive abnormal pain response. And it can radiate as well. You push one part of the body and they feel it somewhere else. Uh, So-called after sensations, that's called hyperpathia. A couple of others are wind up. So it's um, where some neurons recruit what we call other neurons to form part of the pain so the pain itself can spread. Um, probably important to understand what pain tolerance is and what pain threshold is. Threshold is that neural threshold after which you feel pain. Uh, and then pain tolerance is, um, is that threshold, that uh, element of pain that you feel uh, above which you're, you're, able to, to, you're not able to tolerate it. Pain tolerance is a maximum intensity of a stimulus that evokes pain and that a subject is willing to tolerate. So if I, and we don't, I don't do this as part of my clinical practice, this is more for research, but that's the tolerance of pain. And in somebody with neuropathic pain, your tolerance is much lower because you've got so much hypersensitivity. So those are some of the definitions of neuropathic pain. Now, I'm gonna share with you what I think is one of the most debilitating pain conditions. It's called a suicide disease. It's called trigeminal neuralgia. And let me define what trigeminal neuralgia is for you. Um, it is according to the International Classification of Headache Disorders, edition three, this is the strict medical definition of trigeminal neuralgia. Recurrent paroxysms of unilateral facial pain, so one-sided facial pain, in one or more divisions of the trigeminal nerve, of which there are generally three, V1 above the eye, V2 between the eye and edge of the mouth, and V3 below the mouth. So unilateral paroxysms of pain, and this is what the pain should be to, to be able to define it as trigeminal neuralgia. One, it should occur in a short space of time, so either a second or a fraction of a second up to about two minutes. It should be incredibly severe in intensity and it should feel like an electric shock. So that is what trigeminal neuralgia is. There is usually a precipitating trigger, sometimes light touch, wind brushing teeth, something touching the mouth or around the mouth area can trigger trigeminal neuralgia. It doesn't have to be the mouth and can be elsewhere as well. Interestingly, Trigeminal neuralgia affects the right side of the face 60% compared to the left side of the face, and we're not sure why that is. There are three types of trigeminal neuralgia, idiopathic, classical, and secondary. And the classical trigeminal neuralgia is where those symptoms that I've just described occur, and that is because there is some vascular abnormality causing pressure on the trigeminal nerve, uh, and that is defined by MRI scan. And there are, um, and the, the main treatment, which I'll come to in a second, for classic trigeminal neuralgia, if medications, which I'll elaborate on in a few minutes, is not effective, is surgical microvascular decompression. Now, there's something called secondary trigeminal neuralgia, which is generally caused by uh, an abnormality, a disease of the, of the nervous system, a disease or lesion within the somatosensory nervous system. One of them is multiple sclerosis. 
There is also something called idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, where uh, diagnostic tests have failed to define a reason, a cause for the trigeminal neuralgia. It doesn't mean it's not there, it just means there's no defined cause. And notably important for me to say that there are two uh, types of sensations that you can get with trigeminal neuralgia. One is very short, very sharp, where you're free of symptoms between attacks. And the other is where you've got this constant chronic pain. Now, why would this be called a suicide disease? Well, I think it's because when you have facial pain, you're unable to hide from the pain. With foot pain, back pain, you can still sometimes, in a way, distance your brain from the pain. But when you've got facial pain, it's right there, front and center, unpredictable, uh, uh, and it literally drops people in their tracks. You're walking down the street, you drop to the floor with a severe, uh, debilitating uh, facial pain. I just want to give you two more uh, interesting facts before before we go, um, and that is medications that can be used for trigeminal neuralgia. There are quite a few medications that have been successfully used for trigeminal neuralgia. The two big ones are carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine, which have been studied. Um, the studies are quite old, but they can be very helpful for trigeminal neuralgia. And we think it's because they work on the sodium channels of nerves, um, and uh, it can be really effective with trigeminal neuralgia. Other medications that have been studied include lamotrigine, gabapentin, pregabalin, and baclofen, along with Botox, um, Botox injections, yes. If medications are not effective and surgical decompression is uh, a treatment or done uh, or not indicated, there are other interventional approaches that um, can be considered, such as radiofrequency ablation of the various nerves associated with a trigeminal nerve.